I want you to get together. What's the weather out there like uh, in the UK today, brother? Uh, miserable. Miserable. Oh, no. <laughs> Gray, windy, wet, and the rest. Oh, no. Typical typical British weather, we call it. Okay. All right. Stand pretty standard. <laughs> standard for the UK. Yeah. Oh, well. Okay. Well, everyone, I'm so glad uh, that... You could join us today. If you're not online yet, definitely take a, you know, run the playback. This will be up and available on Paul's channel, um, I hope as well, which I'll be uh, telling you about and he'll be sharing with us. Um, let us know if there's any problems with the audio or visual on your end, and we'll get right into it. Today, we welcome researcher, author, and founder of the Nephilim Looked Like, Looked Like Clowns Theory. Mr. Paul Stobbs, as you may know, here at Revealed, we seek to explore the supernatural um, realities of our existence, and the work of Mr. Stobbs fits keenly into our platform. And after exposure to his research, I do believe that most will agree it deserves our attention. First, I was introduced to Paul's work um, on his site, on his YouTube channel. He was inter interviewing Gary Wayne of Genesis 6 Conspiracy fame. Um, Gary's a Gary's uh, an iconic figure in the supernatural realm these days. He's an awesome guy and actually looking to have him on in a couple months. More on that later. It's Paul's moment right now. So, um, and it's God's moment, really, as we expose the darkness and learn about the supernatural uh, realities of our world. Um, so that was where I first heard uh, Mr. Stobbs. And in that interview, he mentioned the book that he's working on and referenced his Nephilim looked like clowns theory. And to say the least, I was in, uh, intrigued. Now, after examining his research, it became obvious his theory is based on verifiable evidence, astonishing evidence. And it's one that I think the masses need to become familiar with. Now, in addition to his upcoming book, Paul runs a channel on YouTube called Understanding Conspiracy where you can find further information on his theory and much, much more. Um, that's for another day, because I was <laughs> looking at the <laughs> looking at the millennial reign. And yeah, wow. So with that, welcome, Paul. I'm glad you agreed to join me tonight. Um, and we'll get right into it. I mean, as you stated, just to kick us off, I wanted to start off with a quote that um, I had heard you make. And... Uh, along the lines at this time, I believe it was eight years. Now it's probably closer to a decade that you've spent trying to prove that what we call a clown in the West, in fact, quote, is a purposely co-opted and molded symbol used by the occult to represent the spirits of the disembodied Nephilim, that is the demon spirits of the deceased giant clans who once roamed the ancient world. So first things first, could you share a bit of your testimony, how you uncovered the evidence leading to your theory, how perhaps that ties into your conversion to faith in Christ? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so um, that was a great introduction, by the way. Thanks for that. And thanks for bringing that quote up. That is a, probably the quickest way of explaining my entire theory that I've said. <laughs> Excellent. Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I always attempt to try and say it as summarized as I can and that's the best way to describe it, as you said there. It's um, it's a symbol more than anything, which was created on purpose, modeled after other cultures around the world that also dress in a similar manner for the same reason, to channel what they call ancestor spirits. In the West, we don't have ancestor spirits. We don't understand that kind of concept. The ancestors mm. they're referring to are the ancient builders of their civilization, so the ancient kings and rulers, which are the antediluvian Nephilim. Um, in the West, we don't really, well, most people don't even believe in a spirit realm, never mind Christianity alone. So they don't even have any concept to understand that kind of thing, that there's spirits on the other side that we can channel. So what was what happened is uh, secret societies created their version of the costume worn by these tribes, and we call that a clown. And we're not supposed to know what it means. It's called, it's an occult symbol. It's hidden in plain sight. So there you go. That's my ele ele quick elevator pitch for what the theory is. And so how I got how I got there is I did start my YouTube channel in 2014. But when, when I started it, it was actually a passion project uh, as a result of um, doing a degree in fine art for three years in the UK. 
And I created this channel as the end result because I spent those three years embroiled in researching the occult, researching biblical history, uh, researching conspiracy theories. Every single one I could get my hands on, I went deep into because I was trying to create a channel that would best explain what people believe who believe conspiracy theories. So that's how the channel came to be. And um, mm. it was actually the 2012 end of the world Mayan calendar thing that was my trigger moment that made me think, What's going on here? Why do, why are people saying these things? And that's where you mm. go down one rabbit hole after another, and you end up becoming a full blown conspiracy theorist a year down the line. You know, that's, that's why. Right. You know, that that was my trigger point. You know, right. and so like I said, fast forwarding through that time, you know, I, I had a life where I wasn't really Christian. I wasn't raised a Christian. I, I've I've never been in a Christian family exactly. My, my grandma was Catholic, but I had limited experience with the Catholic Church through her next to nothing really and in fact i had one experience when i was very young where i went to the church with my grandma and a woman passed out in front of me and as she went down she hit her head on the wooden arm of the pew and mm. I, I think she died i don't think she was in a very good state she was very frail and very old and that impact on the side of her head was pretty brutal um, and that's like my earliest memory of being in a church. To, to, so I didn't go near Christianity for a long time. And I, it wasn't necessarily out of hatred initially. It was just out of, I had no context to understand why I even should. Uh, religion just wasn't a thought in my house, if you get what I mean. Okay. Um, but as I grew older into my teens, I did become a bit of that angsty, anti-God, atheist, scientific, scientific type, you know, who thought uh, religions just for stupid people who were scared of death, that kind of thing. Um, and I did spend a lot of time, you know, ridiculing Christians, shall we say, you know, and mm. people with religious beliefs, maybe from like, I'm talking very early here, you know, but then when, when I was 17, um, you know, I, I had quite a rebellious youth, you know, I was smoking by the age of like 13, I was smoking cannabis by the age of 16 mm. and I, I was on a journey to try and, um, just experiment and have fun and do whatever I could quite hedonistic. And my, my friend at the time suggested I try something called um, Salvia Divinorum. And I, it was something you could actually get for free at the time. And sorry, not, not for free, legally, shall I say, in like what we call head shops in the UK, where they sell things like um, uh, drug paraphernalia, shall we say. But sure, it's all, it's all you know, and it's over the counter. So you could get it legally easily. You know, it was, and so we thought nothing of it. Like, oh, this is probably nothing, just a bit of fun, you know. Mm. I didn't know that then. I'm talking like 15, 16 years ago here. I didn't know then that that particular plant is just as powerful, if not more powerful than dimethyltryptamine, which is the, the most powerful psychedelic in the world. It's actually up there right next to it. I had no idea. So at like the age DMT. of 17, just like DMT, if not more so, um, okay. it's just equally as potent, if not more powerful. And I didn't know that then. But I did, I did this, I had this experience when I was 17 a, a few times, you know, and that opened my eyes to realize, okay, so there's something spiritual happening. I've seen it now. I've seen that with the world. I'm like, okay, so what I see isn't all that there is, you know? And, and as a teenager, you don't know what to do with that information. You, you just bury it, you know, and it stays there, doesn't it? And you, you move on with your life and you have to go through the school system and focus on growing up and going through the growing pains of what it is to be a teenager. So I kind of buried that, but that, that was a trigger point in my life that made me realize I am maybe i was wrong with the whole atheism thing there's something more going on here and hmm. you know as an artist which is what i am and what i got my degree in i've always been a questioner and observer of some kind i've always been a sure. pattern the type of guy who sees patterns in things you know and and by the time i got to uni and again again i had this i, I saw this theory that the world's going to end I had to find out, I had to know, I had to know what is going on. And, and the conspiracies became the subject matter for most of my work. But by this point at university, I'm like 20, 21 years old. And I, I know I'm, I'm heavily exploring psychedelic use, trying to figure out more about this, this realm that I witnessed mm -hmm. and what's going on. And I, I did dimethyltryptamine. I did uh, microdose acid every other day. You know, I experimented with different doses of mushrooms and alternatives. And I was trying to learn I wasn't doing it for fun. I was doing it to try and figure out. So what is this that I'm seeing as an artist? It intrigued me, you know, because of mm. the patterns and the forms and 
it came with a lot of research into what you call new age spiritualism, but I was never one, I was never called myself a new age. I'm not, I'm not really a hippie. I'm a pretty working class Northern British guy. Who's pretty down to earth and not really into all that airy fairy stuff. You know, I've just, I've never been that, I've never been that type, but I was definitely exploring Eastern mysticism, the Tao, um, other perspectives on what spiritualism is. And, and I guess in a way I kind of became something akin to a new ager, but I would never have identified with the the dreadlock hippie types, you know, or the yoga types or anything like that. Okay. Um, so like I said, by the time I was in uni, that's who I was. By so we're not I trying came, to alienate the dreadlock hippies out there, but no, just, no, no, no. Your story. <laughs> that's just not, it's not me. No, it's not right, who right. I was, you know, right. um, but a lot of people would think, oh, you, are you taking drugs and smoking weed every day? You must be some kind of hippie. And I'm like, I'm not, not really. I'm, I'm actually, yeah. T- it's more of a serious scientific endeavor for me. You know, it's more mm. of a, I, I just need to know. I need to know that there's more, you know, because because I've seen some stuff that I can't explain and I, I want exp- I want answers. Mm. And th- through my research in conspiracy in those early years, I did find answers because I kept bumping into a particular perspective that I didn't want to go into. And that was the Christian angle to explain mm. why there is a conspiracy, why we have evil people controlling us, why there's narrative controllers, you know, and why why we have a spiritual war in our in our midst and what what demons are what these people are seeing on dmt what's in these other realms these negative entities exactly and the funny thing is i was never really spiritually attacked when i wasn't a christian and doing all these things i saw very little and i had mainly positive experiences Mm. but after exploring the christian angle things started to get weird for me and it got to the point where I'd hit rock bottom at the end of my degree. I didn't know who I was, where I was going. I'd burnt all my receptors out. I'd become a mess, you know, and um, I had no direction. I felt like I was at my lowest point. And I basically, after researching conspiracy for so long and hearing the Christians preach the gospel and all these other things, and like giving me the answers for why everything's so terrible in the world, I kind of, at one of my lowest moments, I was like, God, I need, I need you to give me answers. I need help. I can't do this anymore on my own. All my research has got me nowhere. Um, you know, I was humoring these ideas that maybe I'm a god or something. You know, maybe mm-hmm. we're all just god trying to, I don't know, experience what it's like to not be a god through humans and, and all the Hindu stuff. You know, but it was not working. It was showing no fruit in my life to think or consider those angles. And and I wasn't happy with who I was. You know, I was I was addicted to nicotine. I smoked cannabis way too much. You know, and I'd, and it's just not who I wanted to be. But it's okay. so after that day, things changed after okay. I asked for help, you know, and um, I <laughs> a nuanced side note here, you know, I took a bath that day after after this. And because I was in a hotel at the time, away for a, a family party to a different city and I was in a hotel. So I had a bath and I, I haven't had a bath in years because I'd only ever lived anywhere with a shower cubicle for sure. like for like. A long time like 10 years you know and it's just a bath is just never something i i, I, t- I took my chance you know right. in this in this hotel I thought, oh i'll have a bath that's that's sure. different but when i did after asking god for help and giving myself over and then getting in the bathtub i can't explain it something happened it's only like a rush of energy went through my body immediately after i submerged myself and i just leaped out the bath and i was like what was that and i thought i was having a panic attack but it faded pretty quick you know after i got out and I think I think I accidentally baptized myself. I really do think that's what happened. You know, it wasn't my intention, but I do I was think thinking that. that. You know, <laughs> it's just one of those weird spiritual experiences that I actually began to have mm. after I asked for help and and came to Jesus. You know, and then from that day, you know, I did drop all my addictions. I, I you know, slowly. Mm. It didn't happen overnight, but I did stop smoking cannabis a year later, and I haven't touched it since. You know, I've been cannabis free now for. Eight, eight years maybe nine years or something like that um i quit smoking cigarettes and i went on to an e-cigarette and i've been lowering the nicotine amount on that for so many years and now i'm nicotine free completely now for a year so i've got mm. off that finally i haven't touched a psychedelic since or anything else no drugs whatsoever i don't drink um i, I do have caffeine in the morning but i'm i switch for decaf every now and then i'm not perfect you know? but sure, I, no i became a different person that day I understand and, and everything I, did, I I know what it means to be born again now it is a real spiritual experience mm. the re, there's a real change you know and I, I hope my testimony can be proved to that to most people because anybody who knew me prior and knows me now they would say this is not the Paul I knew growing up you know 
Sure. But uh, by this point, it's 2016, and I'd had a two two years of being a born again Christian, where I just studied the Word and biblical history. People like Gary Wayne were a huge influence for me. You know, I was reading his book on contrarian bi biblical history, understanding mm. the Book of Enoch, the Giants, and I was finally getting the answers I needed from these narratives that explained why God of the Old Testament did the things He did, like genocide all of humanity and reset everything. That's a huge contentious issue for most early well, non-Christians, why would really? a cruel, vindictive God just murder everybody? Why would God do that? You know, it doesn't seem very loving to me, right? But mm -hmm. when you actually understand what was going on during that time, the corruption of that time, you realize mm -hmm. it was it was a mercy. And thank God that he actually did that. Otherwise, we would not be here, you know, mm -hmm. and um, thank God for sending his son to give us some authority over what remained, which is the disembodied spirits of these Nephilim, you know. Mm -hmm. And these were big answers for me. And as somebody who wasn't raised in a church, I had no preconceived dogma necessarily where I would deny these books or some preacher was telling me to only listen to his interpretation. And over, I didn't have any of that, you know, so I was pretty an open book, just taking everything in from everywhere, you know, mm. as I've, I realized as long as I have the basic gospel down, you know, that Jesus Christ died for my sins. and I believe who he said he was, then we'll be saved. Everything else on top of that is free is fair game as far as I'm concerned. So I have been creating this YouTube channel and exploring all these biblical concepts. And sure. I started getting attacked when I started doing that spiritually. As soon as okay. I stopped the drugs is when I started getting really heavily attacked by demonic entities, I would say. Um, sleep paralysis, uh, deep shadow entities, spider demons coming down to me while I'm pinned down in dream states, waking up screaming, things like that. Um, I had a, a moment in my living room where the corners of the room started to go black and it started to spin into a vortex like the going into the DMT realm. But it was darkness and I could feel my own soul being torn from my body and I went paralyzed. It felt like my brain was shutting down. It felt like maybe I was having a stroke or something or I was just dying, like just physically death was happening to me. Mm. And all I could do was say the words, Jesus help me. And then instantly back in the room, gone. Mm. I'm there again, sweating, <laughs> you know, a bit rattled, mm. but I could move again and I wasn't dying anymore, you know? And that for me was a moment, a true moment where I was like, this is real. Mm. We're in the middle of a serious spiritual war and mm. we, need to, we need to know the weapons that we can use to protect ourselves. And that's what my channels began to become about. How can we fight against these monsters on the other side that, that I know are there, you know? Mm. And so spiritual warfare became a huge part of my research. And it led me to understand the Nephilim, the history of the Nephilim, who these entities really are, how we, how they got there. Mm -hmm. And then, cause, cause I had been swimming in this information for so long, something happened in 2016. There was this clown sighting phenomena, which was just on the news. Now, first of all, I like to preface, I don't care about clowns. I wasn't raised a clown fan. I don't, okay. it has nothing to do with my life. You know, I, 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 they have never even been a second thought for me then. And to be honest, when I'm not writing the book or doing, making the videos, they're not really a major forefront of my thought in waking life either, because I don't think about them. They're just not, I, I'm not a fanatic about clowns. But when I saw the media showing us clown hysteria sightings everywhere menacing clowns on street corners luring people into the woods scaring people on every single news broadcast all across america it was mm -hmm. happening everywhere including england it was happening in everywhere okay. at least the western hemisphere was happening you know in the western world and yep. i realized from my years of being into the uh, researching the occult and secret societies and the methods used against us for mind control and things like that like okay so if they're showing us something on TV, that box in the corner of the room, they want us to see it. It means something when they show you something on there. It's a message of some kind. And what does the clown mean as symbol is all I can think in my mind. It means something. They're trying to tell us something by uh, creepy clown sightings. What does mm. that mean? So I, I, something compelled me to just go out there and do some research into um demons and clowns and i already knew okay so demons are nephilim mm -hmm. and there's this scary demonic clown thing going on so what if i just search the key terms nephilim and clown nothing mm -hmm. came up nobody has ever put those two words together ever mm -hmm. okay it just hadn't happened by this point right right and um, i just want to just to make clear for those who aren't so aware the belief and the understanding is that the nephilim or the giants that ruled yes the ancient world 
And when Joshua, the conquest where Paul referenced uh, the slaughter of these tribes and these clans, when they were killed off, their spirits were left, I believe, in the dry places, right? They're left roaming. They didn't have a place to go. They didn't go to heaven. They didn't go to hell. So these, that's where we get our spirits that he's going to um, further explain here. So you have these spirits. And um, go ahead, Paul. You can continue. Yeah. So like I said, the, the, I knew they were trying to show us this and it meant something. So my cursory search was Nephilim clown. Any connection? Has anyone ever thought about this concept before? Because something, something, there's something demonic about these representations of clowns today, especially in the mainstream media. And they're trying to, they're literally trying to show them to us. They want people to know about clowns appearing. So mm -hmm. I, I was just fired. My, my neurons were firing everywhere. And I knew there's something here just from my prior research. My pattern recognition was kicking in, let's say, you know. And I, I managed to find a video which had no reference to clowns in the title, but it was just a video by a very small YouTube channel called The Epic Conspiracy. And he wasn't actually a real conspiracy theorist. He was somebody making mock videos to, to make fun of us, to make fun of conspiracy theories, you know. Mm -hmm. And he, he did want an expose on the Nephilim, and he described what the Nephilim looked like, and they had pale white skin and red hair, you know. And he says there's only one explanation, the interdimensional killer clowns from out of space, you know. <laughs> and from that moment, I realized, that he, although he's taking the mick out of us, he's actually right. saying something that has some truth to it. Right, There's he was something. mocking. Yeah, yeah, he had no idea about that concept, you know, so and I don't think he went any deeper into it ever again, and I think he's probably forgot that thing. I don't even know if he even knows about this, you know, what I've been doing for eight years, to be honest, but uh, when he made that joke, I've rolled with it because I realized actually there's a connection here between clowns and the Nephilim. There's something going on, okay? Mm. And like I said, eight years later, it's just absolutely ridiculous how how deep this goes into our history um, mm. and where the clown actually comes from. We'll get into it, obviously, as we go on. But uh, yes. maybe, maybe we'll just explain that, yes, the Nephilim are the offspring of fallen angels who mated with human women, okay? Most people, when they imagine the Nephilim or have drawn the Nephilim or have represented it with pictures on their videos, they always show a really, really tall hench pectoral muscled loincloth wearing long brown haired human that's what they always mm -hmm. look like big humans that mm -hmm. look like barbarians of some kind that is so far from how they would have actually looked mm -hmm. they would have looked nothing like that what this guy doesn't have the hair but this is one version yeah. of a this is the the typical go-to mm -hmm. what i'm saying is when you mix a seraphim angel a fiery flying serpent with a human woman, you get something that looks more akin to a clown than an actual human who's a giant. And again, we can get into that later, but that's the basic premise of where the idea came to me mm -hmm. um, and, and what led me there, really. But um, like I say, it's been a long time since then, to be honest, and uh, the, the work has got much deeper than that. And uh, I am actually writing the book. Um, yes. I'm, I'm about to release volume one in the next couple of months. Um, awesome. I have I've written, well, I have, 19 chapters i'm just finishing the last two now uh so it's, it's on its way and there's another 15 chapters to come after that over the next year um but i'm going to publish volume one very soon okay great great um uh, thank you that was a amazing story man um i relate you know to a lot of it as far as the lifestyle um that sort of thing and then god beginning to kind of expose the darkness and expose um you know the the reality of a supernatural realm mm -hmm. and you learn that there's this darkness and there's light they're right there's how i sum it up now a lot of times is there's two kingdoms right there's the kingdom of light kingdom of darkness and it's a clash and uh the more you know uh you know the better equipped you are to understand mm -hmm. uh these things but far as getting right in into the um the evolution of this of this clown um so basically if i understand you correctly you're saying one way that the nephilim that the spirits of the deceased nephilim these these demonic spirits one way that they manifest and show themselves is via the clown that's one of these vehicles and from what we're learning today it's a big one because we see clowns all the time children right at the circus um they're a big deal 
Um, and we can get into a little bit of that. I jotted down a couple of things you had referenced Harlequin. Mm -hmm. Um, where does that come from as far as, um, th this wild man, um, idea that I've heard you mention and how that evolved to Harlequin. And then from there. Yeah. Get yeah. So what, what I'll give you is the history of the European clown and why, why we yeah. have it and where the costume came from and how, how that kind of transformed throughout. It's, it's over a good, just over a thousand year period, really, that we got to where we got to today with our version of a clown. Now, okay. I want people to pref. I want to preface this first of all. My work isn't about the actions of clowns and how they behave. Okay, that's one thing. I I deal solely with the aesthetics. Okay, the way they looked and what that means and how it works. Okay, now the way a clown behaves, you could start getting into all the. Um, the metaphysical, archetypical, philosophical, metaphorical understanding. But I think you start getting lost in the weeds a little bit when you start going down all that philosophical route to try and over-intellectualize what I'm trying to say here. Okay, I'm talking about the way they looked specifically and their actions are secondary to what I'm talking about here. Just to keep okay. things simple. Okay, so first of all, so funny people, comedians have always been around since the beginning of humanity. So this isn't about the origin of funny people people who act like comedians okay but when you want to talk about the origin of the costume of a clown you want to begin with the collapse of rome so during that time there were things like um mimes and kind of something akin to a jester performer called a sanio um, and they had the mimicus and um the stupidus and these were like the proto early clowns which came out of the attic theater of greece prior but these people wore masks and acted in over-dramatized ways, usually mimicking um, prominent figures of society. You know, statesmen, policemen, soldiers, rich people, poor people, the servants, stock characters, you know, people people would recognize, they would act like them, and people would laugh and give them money. And there was always these theaters shows happening where they had these stock characters and they did improvised shows during the Roman Empire. But as the Roman Empire like, went through its decline and Catholicism rose, um, actors were considered quite filthy and whorish, like prostitutes. It was kind of frowned upon to be an actor. So the, the profession kind of diminished. And you don't see much progression, really, during the Middle Ages of, of the performance of theatre itself and these characters. But not in a mainstream sense, because you'll find things like jesters appear during the Middle Ages, because these were these former actors who needed work. And the only people allowed to really have entertainers were the rich and affluential. It was considered like a um, a necessity to have your own personal fool if you were a king, you know. And because it's it's against the law to have them anywhere else, so, but they're kind of above the law. So it's kind of I have my jesters because we're allowed them, you know. And mm. jesters are one thing, okay. Jesters are just uh, there to entertain the king for one, but a lot of the time they also became the mouthpiece of the king for propaganda. Um, and sometimes they mm. became friends with the kings, but they were basically just um, mercenary comedians for hire. That's what jesters mm. were, you know. It was quite a, a lavish life for a lot of them who went along with the propaganda of the, of the monarchs, you know. And mm. there might be something that could be said for a clown-like entity whispering in the ears of the rulers if the costume of a clown is there to channel the Nephilim. It means every king had a court Nephilim there to influence them. You could go into that route if you wanted to. Sure. You know, but from but while that was happening in the Middle Ages and you had these private hired actors who were kind of something like a clown, a fool, shall we say, but their costume was copying the king. Jesters dressed like kings. The crown, but the flop, but it's floppy with bells. The scepter but it's the king's scepter, but it's usually got a joker's head on it instead with a blown up bladder on the bottom. They were there to kind of make fun of and poke fun at the way a, a rich person looks. So that's not really anything to do with demons where the costume of a jester comes from. So maybe we can leave jesters as kind of like a side note for now because they're not really necessary. But they did influence a character that did appear within a movement called the Comédie dell'Art. So the Comédie dell'Art were a troop of traveling actors that left rome after the collapse and the takeover of catholicism because they were out of work and weren't welcome there anymore so what they kind of did was travel europe making very quick stages in the middle of town halls and town squares shall we say doing a quick improvised performance with masks on with stock characters and then get some money off people into the hat 
move the move the stage, go to the next city. And that's all they did. You know, that that was the tradition of the Comédie de l'Arts. They just did quick improvised shows in every everywhere in Europe. They made it from all the way from the, the southern tip of Portugal to the northern part of Russia. You know, these people traveled a vast distances over a thousand years, mastering the art and the tradition. You know, it was in the family and they picked people up as they traveled to join the troupe. It was like the, the first kind of traveling circus in a way. Sure, which we still but have it, today. Yeah, but it was it was solely a, a theater thing actors shows proper dramas you know but with comedy in there and routines that were stock and copied over and over again and you'll find the stock characters were pretty basic you know like i said it was the policeman the rich man the daughter of the rich man the servants the king the they just people that audiences would recognize no matter where they went everybody understood who the rich person was or who a soldier was so it they would be recognized that's the whole point of being a stock character but then coming out of the, the Middle Ages into the 15, 1600s, there was a character added, which wasn't originally a part of it all, called Arlecchino in, in it's Italian or oh. um, Harlequin in French. OK, so Arle Arlecchino is modeled after Italian, uh, an Italian impoverished beggar, like a stock, a stock beggar um, from Bergamo specifically that Mediterranean region. But he's also modeled after Dionysus and uh, Mercury. Mercury has his staff, his caduceus, and Dionysus would have his thyrsus, which is has a pine coin on the end. Dionysus is the patron saint of theater, out of Greek theater. That's what he controls. Okay. And wine and partying and all those type of things, you know. Um, so you find this Harlequin character is Ardecchino, modeled after impoverished fools of Italy and ancient uh, witty deities of and f fleet of foot to witty be able to do backflip types of characters mercury was very quick quick footed he has wings on his feet you know he's that type of character it's almost like he's flying and arlicino had the same attitude he was a performer a tumbler um okay. wild with his movements you know but mm -hmm. it seems like it wasn't just this mediterranean influence that created this new character called arlicino it was northern Teutonic myths of the wild man of Europe that were also mm. mixed with these Mediterranean characters to create what we call Harlequin. And it's specifically modeled after one type of wild man, which is from France, who was called Helikins. So it's okay. Hel Helikins is where we get Harlequin, but the Italians mm. named him Arlicino. That's how they pronounce it. So they, they pronounce mm. Helikins as Arlicino, and that's where we get it from. And it's literally modeled after the wild men of Europe. Now, the wild men of Europe tradition is an odd thing because this is something that no matter where you go in Europe, you can go to every country, Portugal, Spain, France, where Switzerland, uh, Belgium, all the way to Norway, Finland, England, Ireland, you can just name anywhere, all the Eastern European countries, Bulgaria, Romania, the rest, you know, everywhere, Rome, just name a country in Europe. You can literally put your finger on a map anywhere and just type in wild man tradition. And they all have their own version of this, their own mm -hmm. way of doing it, their own style, but it's all rooted in the same thing. They are trying mm -hmm. to copy and look like demonic, hairy, giant beasts. That's what they're trying to look like. They're literally Nephilim, Nephilim creatures, okay? Mm -hmm. That Rome, then this is the European flavor because they were all over the place originally. And this is the what the Europeans had to contend with. And it's what people have created rituals that have gone down throughout society mm -hmm. all about these wild men of Europe with their club and their wild, crazy, giant nature. Mm. Now, this, this monk in the 10th century, in the middle of the Middle Ages, uh, so 500 years before Harlequin was a character in this movement, um, documented that he had witnessed in France Helikins and his wild horde of demons roving through his city and causing chaos you know, and, and damage everywhere. And that's what he would do. Helikins would travel with his giant club and tower over an army of little demons who would follow him. Funnily enough, Dionysus, the Greek god, um, which is uh, from Thracia, it's a foreign god. It's actually foreign to uh, Greek originally. It's more of a Thracian culture thing, which is now what you call Romania or Bulgaria in Europe. Dionysus was also a traveling giant god who had his fauns and meonads follow him wherever he went, making a giant party happen. And he would attract new people into his horde and 
this constant party that would go on forever and they would right. go on to the next place because he was the patron god of wine and partying and sex and everything and theater you know so this this wild man seemed to do the same thing as dionysus was doing in greece you know it's very very strange and if you find that dionysus is from the thracian culture the romanian culture and the bulgarian culture today uh, they actually have the oldest example of the wild man tradition that still happens today called the cookery where they dress up in hairy wild beast with horns and big long te- big wide grin teeth you know and everything like that now this is everywhere even in portugal which is probably the opposite side of europe they have something called the caretos and they're a lot more colorful with the way they do it a lot more clownish in fact but it's the same thing it's the same tradition hmm. they have a huge party of excess where they drink and eat and be merry and have sex or whatever it is and then they fast so it's kind of a catholicized version of these ancient excess rituals so Mm. rather than get rid of them when catholicism swept throughout europe during the middle ages and the christian ideals came they christianized the original tradition they became the period of fasting before lent you would have this giant party where you would dress like demons so that's what it is you know the nephilim and they all look the same they're all these big hairy multicolored fractal patterned crazy looking wide grinning beast monsters with multicolored ribbons all over the bodies they look like clowns by today's standards you know mm. so that's where harlequin comes from which was added into as a stock character that everybody would recognize in europe into the play so okay. everyone knew they all know who the wild man is so let's make it a character in our shows as a stock basic thing so the original harlequin costume was white with multicolored patches all over the body and then a mask on which was black with wild beast eyes covered in hair and he mm. had a and he had a club which was called the slapstick and okay he would have magical powers. He would be able So this to... is where we get the slapstick comedy. Yeah. So what he would do, he would slap the stage and the scene mm. would change. He had magic powers. He was supposed to represent the demonic. That's the point. That's that was the mm. introduction of it. He was the wild card, the comedian, the 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 it, at first he was kind of a foolish character, but he very quickly became the quick witted, sharp witted, vicious character, the demonic character who kind of had one over on everybody else, you know, and he was rude and crude with his phallus symbol in his hand, you know, poking people with it and making uh, masturbation jokes, you know, whatever. That's kind of what he did, you know, that was the point of Harlequin at the time. But, you know, 200 years of this character, he kind of got boring. He got less demonic, more fancy, more sophisticated, more about an educated man about town rather than the brutish demonic beast he originally was. Yeah, this is where mm. he starts getting a bit fancier. You know, this by mm. this point. But prior to this, he had a much more loose-fitting, ragged uh, garb on, very beast-like. You know, and you can find okay. if you type in a Harlequin costume progression, you'll probably see it. I think people, yes, I think people have shown it somewhere. Um, but it it did change dramatically over the years, and over two hundred years, he, his character wasn't demonic anymore. It was boring. You know, and it was kind of a void that got left there. So who's going to replace Harlequin as the demon? And in in Britain, it was the clown. Okay, so in Britain, by this point, pantomime, which is where this all comes from, this this movement of the Comédie de l'Art, was really popular in Britain. And the main the major theatres in London, the Sadler's Wells Theatre and the Royal Theatre, were both putting on their own pantomime epics. Okay, and pantomime generally was like a four-hour show of drama, but the last hour was just called the Harlequinade, was just a wild chase scene it was nuts it was just a looney tune style wacky chase scene with the people jumping through holes in stages and out of windows and it was the rich old man and his servant clown chasing after harlequin and the rich man's daughter so harlequin steals the daughter from the rich man and whisks her away and they run off together and the old man chases after them with his servant clown and that's just the wacky that's the wacky show for an hour you know and they would they would just beat each other poke each other with hot sticks you know do all sorts of horrible things to each other then the next scene they'd be miraculously healed of all the damage and they'd be going on to do the next thing and that was really popular in britain and people started to love the character of clown now clown in the old comedie de l'art movement was a servant of the rich man yes but he was called pedrolino and he wasn't really that wacky he was a zany character, a bit more foolish, a bit dopey, a bit of the dope to the quick-wittedness of Harlequin. Mm. Harlequin was the 
the funny, sharp-witted fool. Pedrolina was the slow to get to the point fool who didn't really understand what was going on. And that that was it's like Laurel and Hardy. You know, that was the okay. comedy duo of the time. And that's kind of a tradition. So when when Harlequin changed and stopped being so witty and demonic, they need they needed a new dynamic duo. And I guess they just changed roles. <laughs> and the clown became the witty one instead. And this happened with the costume change as well. So Pedrolino, up to this point, was quite boring. He just wore a plain white rag with a ruff. And it was like a servant rag. It was nothing. It was like tatters. You know, it wasn't colorful or anything. There was no color to it. It was just boring white clothing. And um, you'll find in France, it had Poirot, which was their interpretation of Pedrolino from the Italian tradition. And Poirot was a silent mime type character dressed in all white. He didn't wear a mask. He was the first clown not to wear a mask. He had white face makeup on instead. And he looks very ghost-like, very ethereal. But he was silent and he had these expressions on his face of sadness all the time. Mm-hmm. Poirot was boring too. Yeah, this is Poirot, you know. He was more sad that mm. the daughter of the rich man wanted Harlequin and not him. That was kind of his shtick, you know, the sad sack clown who never got who can never have a love, you know. Very French, you know, very, very French sounding story, you know. But in Britain, Clown was just a wacky drunk. He was just nuts, you know. He didn't care about love. He just cared about getting sausages and drinking beer, you know. That was <laughs> so so people loved. People loved that version of Clown, that, that version of Pedrolino. And there was a, an actor of the time called Joseph Grimaldi, who was young, young at the time, up and coming, very well connected in the industry, had been in that theatre his entire life. His father was a famous actor in the same uh, realm, realm as well, uh, quite well respected. Well, Grimaldi kind of got his big break when um, someone called Charles Dibdin took over the theatre as the, as the script writer and the, the, run, the showrunner. Now, Charles Dibdin is an interesting character, okay? Charles Dibdin, the younger, was the son of Charles Dibdin, the elder, okay? Charles Dibdin, the elder, is a Freemason. He was a member of the Leicestershire Lodge. Um, He's well-documented. You can go find a eulogy to him 100 years after his death from the same Lodge records, you know, where they're talking about what an amazing guy he was and how much he contributed to the British Navy and all these type of things with his maritime songs, you know? He was actually a very very famous musician of the era, Charles Dibdin, Mm -hmm. the elder. He was like a rock star of the time. Everyone knew who his name was. Everyone knew who who, who his songs were, what his plays were. He wrote so many Harlequinards, you know. He he was just a big mogul of the media industry of the day. We have them today, the Illuminati music industry, you know. Like, he was was that of that time period of the 1800s, of the 1700s. He was the guy in control of the media then, you know, basically. One, One of many, you know. And he okay. actually created the first circus in um, England. Now, circuses in the 1700s were just horse tricks. It was a man on a horse doing backflips, running around in a circle. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Charles Dibdin looked at Astley's Circus, which wasn't called a circus. It's called Astley's Equestrian something or other. A really long-winded, silly name. Okay. Well, Charles Dibdin, the Freemason, saw this and just across the road opened his own version but he called it the Royal Circus. That's the first time in Britain the word circus has been used from Roman circuses to describe that kind of show in Britain. So he actually invented and coined the phrase circus in that sense in Mm. Europe. (laughs) He's actually the first guy to do that. And then his son goes on to take over the most popular theatre of the area, Sadler's Wells. So they keep it in the family, these people, you know. So this is Charles Jr., Charles Jr. Yeah, so he takes over in the 18, 1799. And prior to that, his brother, Thomas Dibdin, mm-hmm. had also been running it for a few years. So they really do keep it in the family, you know. Once mm-hmm. he takes over this theatre um, at the behest of Richard Hughes, who owns the theatre, he hired him. And Richard Hughes is friends with Charles Dibdin, the senior. He helped him open that original circus I was telling you about. <laughs> they're, all, they're all connected here. Um, something happens to the costume of clown. So Joseph Grimaldi is an up-and-coming actor. He's proved that he knows what he's doing. He's funny. He's witty. Everyone loves him. And Richard Hughes says to Charles Dibdin the Younger, you need to give him a leading role. You have to put him in your place as a leading role because he married my daughter and she just died and made me promise to look after him. (laughs) Mm, So Joseph Grimaldi had married Richard Hughes' daughter and she died a pregnant at birth and lost both the baby and herself. 
So, so her last words were, be kind to poor Joe Richard. Please be kind. Okay. And he promised, okay, look after him. Give him give him the leading role, make him clown. But there was a competition at the time because Dubois was the famous clown who had always played the role, an established old time actor, you know. Um, but Joseph Grimaldi wiped him off the, off the stage. He was so much better than this old actor who had been doing it for years. Because to get around it, Charles Dibbin said, okay, well, we'll make two clowns. We'll have two clowns. It's never been done before. We'll do two clowns on the stage at once. And yeah, Joseph won by miles. He, okay. he was a clown. He wasn't just acting like one. Like he, he just embodied it so much. Like he was so natural that people were just busting with laughter at just the sight of the guy. He, the way he contorts his face, you know. So something happened after his success. The costume of the clown changed too, and it's so odd. The costume of the clown became went from a boring white servant rag from Pedrolino and Puero. And it became a monstrous, psychedelic, frilled, patterned, multicolored dress of some kind. Mm. So far removed from its original 300-year-old tradition type clothing. Just a sudden change. And it's never explained why. It's never mm. explained. Just that it did happen. Okay, mm, <laughs> And okay. I think Charles Dibden can be quoted as saying, you know, it's, um, you know, with a new era of, 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 running this show and to make my mark, I wanted to do something different, something basic. We're not explaining where he got his inspiration from exactly. Just that he did it to make a change in the industry, which is a bit cryptic when you think about it. Um, mm. And I did some research on this and I mm. found out I found out why it turns out his father, Charles Dibden senior loved India would travel back and forth to India a lot because Charles Dibden senior's brother, who is also called Thomas, by the way, just to really complicate matters even more. Yeah. So, you, so you have two seniors, Thomas and uh, Charles. Charles. Yeah, Charles and Thomas, brothers. But then Charles has two sons, Charles and Thomas. Okay. <laughs> the, right. Honestly, the 1800 genealogy is a mess. And often when you try to pass this apart, um, they often equate achievements to the wrong people. You okay. know, so I had to kind of splay all this apart myself to find out who was actually who and what was really going on. It's all over the place. It's just mm. a mess. It's just a mess when you start going through family trees as well. It's all over the place. Honestly, it's, and everyone was cheating on everybody else as mistresses and it just gets even more complicated. <laughs> it's just a nightmare, but I passed it through and it turns out Charles Dibdin senior's brother, Thomas was a member of the British Navy, more specifically the East India company who was colonizing India at that time. Okay, okay. This, is, this is the peak of Indian colonization when this was happening. And his brother actually died in India doing this. So Charles made a song dedicated to him. And that song became incredibly famous with the British Navy. The, the, the sailors were singing it on the, the voyages, you know what I mean? It's one of those type of songs. It kept the morale of the nation up during wartime, you know, all these types. That's why he's equated as one of the greatest maritime war song writers of all times and the greatest playwright representing the, the wars and sailors of the times, you know. Um, he's equated with being one of the people who kept the country's morale alive, you know, and thanks to Charles Dibden Sr., we won the wars because of his music, you know. Well, That's how okay. much they love this guy. But anyway, he was actually going to move to India, Charles. He, was, he had the ship ready to go. It was about to go and bad weather stopped it. So he decided against it in the end and stayed in England until his death. But he was going to move to India because he'd been there so much and loved it and just wanted mm. a fresh start, you know. And I believe, as a traveling man, a member of the Freemason Lodge, which are just continuations of ancient serpentine worship cults from the past, the mystery school wisdoms, the, the wisdoms of Enoch, you know, the wisdoms mm -hmm. of Solomon, all these type of uh, ancient demonic cult which is what he was what freemasonry is at the end of the day if anyone has done any research whatsoever it's very clear what's going on there i believe when he went to india he paid close attention to the representations of nephilim there because these are the spirits he communicates with in his own mm. lodges you know that's what they're really all about that's who he's actually in communion with and i think he took inspiration from the demons the rakshasa demons of india and brought it to england and his son dress the first clown in that costume during that costume change because if you look at the costume of a uh, let's let's type in if you get your images up here i'll help you with this one just to get a visual type in joseph grimaldi 
Just type uh, in Joseph Grimaldi. And this was the first actor who was dressed in this costume for the first time. Okay, let's see. And we'll share the screen. Grimaldi. Where's my screen share on this? I can download a photo. Can I share my screen? I think it's just at the bottom. It's present. Present, share screen. Boom. Well, thank you, sir. And I think you've got to click at the bottom and click the screen so everyone can see it because there should be two yeah. boxes now. Yeah. I'm streaming to three places, so it's asking, I guess, which one I want to... I tell you what, I'll do it. I'll do it. I sh it should be easier for me to do it than you, I think. All right. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry, Paul. No, Thank okay. you so much. It's okay. So you if I what? share the screen. Mm -hmm. and... Okay, I'll just share my entire screen. And if you just click on the bottom there, there should be to me, and then next to me is something called Understanding Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And you should be able to... If you go back to StreamYard, it should be there at the bottom of StreamYard. Okay, there you are. Boom. Yeah. Okay, there so that, that's sharing now. Okay, so if I yes, there, can everyone see that? Are you okay? Is it clear? Yes. Okay, so Joseph Grimaldi. So this is the actor who was dressed in the first clown costume, which was the Change. Okay, and here's one of the first drawings of him. That's quite famous. Okay. Okay. So look at this costume. Terrifying. It's nuts. All right. Now, Pedro right. Lino, who the clown is based after, used to dress like this. It's quite boring, isn't it? Nothing to it, really. Plain, right. white, servant rags, Elizabethan style with a ruffled neck. Nothing much. But this is the servant of the rich man. This is the first version of clown. Similar to, similar to Piero, as we... Yeah, like the French version. Poirot was mm -hmm. just a, a spin on that. And Poirot looked more like this. Poirot, you know? okay. Yeah, this is the French version, and that was the Italian version, Pedrolino, you see here. And then okay. Joseph Grimaldi, clown, was suddenly dressed like... I just showed you there. Uh, this thing. Yes, okay. Terrifying, right? Now... Yes. This is a Rakshasa demon of Thailand. Hmm. Let me just get a good image of the temples. So you look at that costume. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Okay. And now you look at this thing. Yes. Yeah. That's what he copied. He saw the demons of the Nephilim of India. And he modeled the new clown after it. Mm. Pretty simple. For he got Specifically, it I believe it's Balasong Sang. Is that the... Well, there's there's a version of the, Cal of the Rakshasa demon, the Kala... Sung sang, and that just Hannah means that just means upside down demon. Okay. Um. So here it is. Oh. It wants to. It's not the highest quality, but there you go. That's that, mm. and that's that. It's a specific version of the demon, there but they're go. all the they're all rakshasas. They're all just the classes of the same thing. A rakshasa demon. And that was where the car costume was modeled after. So not only was Harley Quinn this thing modeled after the wild men of Europe, the first European version of a Nephilim, the wild giants. Here's an early version of him with his patchwork, multicolored skin and clothing and his beast mask mm. like this. So this is the first proto modeled after a demon clown. And then he was replaced by Joseph Grimaldi. He was modeled after this thing. So okay. no matter what nothing you, new under the sun. Yeah, no matter what you go in history, whether it's Harlequin with his club, who's right. modeled after the wild man of Europe, which is a demon, or whether you go to the clown of Britain, which is modeled after the demons of India, the mm. clown is always has always been modeled after demons, historically speaking. Always has mm. been. And it was done intentionally by Freemasons. <laughs> like secret societies look at this vision that looks like a clown by any standards doesn't it big red wide grin lips uh wild bulging guys you know and this is this is where we get the first version of this the first proto version of this um the early costumes worn by the theaters of britain by joseph grimaldi given to him by a freemason <laughs> called charles dibdin modeled after literal demons so there you go <laughs> clowns are clowns are literally modeled after demons 
I can start. I mean, it's it. right there. The inspiration's yeah. right there. Absolutely. If I can get the Harlequin costume, see, he keeps coming up with uh, the modern Harlequin from comic books, which is nothing to do with <laughs> right. what I'm talking about, really. Um, mm -hmm. If I go to Camille Delart, maybe I can find. Here we go. So this is how Harlequin originally dressed. Boring patchworks with this mask. And then as time went on, he became this fancy, tight, leotard-wearing, sailorish person, you know. Mm. He changed dramatically. He was demonic at first, and then he became fancy and, and boring. Mm. And that's when Clown took over in Britain and became the demonic version. So it was to, it was to replace the demon. You know, that's why Clown was originally changed. He was to replace the missing demonic nature of Harlequin. Mm. Um, and you'll find, actually, not long after that, funnily enough, something similar happened in the future. Um, so the white-faced clown, which is what Grimaldi is, you know, he is a white-faced clown. Um, and he was the, he's called the father of, of modern clowns, by the way. All clowns based their costumes off of him from then on. It became the industry standard to dress that way if you're a clown. Mm. Well, white-faced clowns, they began to stop being so demonic and became really, really intelligent and witty instead. They were, clowns were quite foolish originally, demonic and foolish. But as he got a bit more intelligent and a bit maybe too intelligent, they needed more foolish characters to appear. And mm. that's where you get the August Clown here in the middle. Now, the August yeah. Clown was the replacement. Just like Harlequin was replaced by Whiteface, Whiteface kind of got replaced by August as time went on <laughs> to be the more foolish character. And August Clowns tend to have elongated skulls, not unlike the Nephilim, you know. Mm. <laughs> and they they um, have more of a peach-coloured skin as well as their wide brow look to them. Um, and they have psychedelic patchwork clothing. They are... Uh, it, it just kind of the patterns repeat, but mm. the motifs are all Nephilim features. Sure. They always have. They always have been. Sure. So there you go. There's the history yeah. of uh, how secret societies literally created. Yeah, the I image mean, of the I guess so, yeah. the most compelling is definitely the Dibdin's trip to India. India. Yeah, and, and seeing that. What? How do you pronounce it? The Raksh. The Rakshasa demon. Now Rakshasa. It's, it's, it's funny, it's funny, because after I made my videos about that, learning mm. it from my own research, you know, um, Joe, who runs uh, JC Follows J, uh, JT Follows JC YouTube channel, I've been talking to him quite a lot recently, said, oh, have you ever seen uh, Supernatural, um, the TV show? And I was like, no. But he said, yeah, there's an episode there where a circus clown um, gets invited into the home because a, children, a child lets him in and he eats the parents. And it turns out this circus clown is a Rakshasa demon. <laughs> and this is in the show. This mm. is what it turns out to be. The clown here, the circus clown, is actually a flesh-eating demon called a Rakshasa. Mm. So this, this was made in 2006. This was years before I even made my... Uh, no, this is before I even made my theory or even put this together, right. but it turns out they've been showing us this in the controlled media for a while. Right. And they're calling it Rakshasa. Can you bring up that Raksh Rakshasa one more time? The original Indian, um, the Hindu, I mean, yeah. Yeah, right there. there it is. Right there. But you find yeah. this, this look um, is all across the Indic regions. They all have their own version of the demon of the Nephilim and they all look similar. If you go to the Rakshasa masks, for example, mm. of um, Sri Lanka, they have their own flavor. Um, and they look like this. Mm. White face with red lips. Um, they also have these masks as well. A serpent-human hybrid. A fiery flying serpent angel mixed with a human would look something like this. Big, wide, red-lipped, grinning, sharp-toothed mouth, wild, bulging eyes, psychedelic-colored skin like that of a serpent and you'll find they do rituals with these de demon masks um, to bring health and also to scare away demons and many other things. But this is their version of a Rakshasa. This is the, the, the Sri Lankan version. Quite okay. terrifying looking beasts. But then if you go to like dragon masks of China, um, mm -hmm. that's their version. You know, they have their own version of the exact same beast here. Mm -hmm. This is what the Nephilim would have looked like.
they looked like clowns. So when the clown was created in the 1800s, mm -hmm. it was modeled after these specific creatures. Mm -hmm. um, Go back to that, that original clown to where it's doing the pose of the, sure. um, jo was that Joseph Grimaldi? Okay. Joseph so this, Grimaldi. Yeah. So here he is okay. doing his handstand. And here we go. Yeah. I just want to hammer that home. Um, for those, those viewing and he'll run it back. That's, I mean, you could see with their tri with Grimaldi's trip to, or um, Dibden's trip to India, was that correct? Where he and so yes. then via him inspired that look, which Joseph Grimaldi carried. Yeah. Now the, the irony is Joseph Grimaldi is always the one who's been given all the credit. He's the father of modern clowns. He created the modern clown image. It was all Joseph Grimaldi, you know. But he was just a, a patsy. He was a he was just a really good actor who put on the costume he was told to put on, you mm. know. He actually had very little to do with making the costume of a modern clown, but he's been given all the credit. He acted like a, an amazing clown. He was a great clown actor. He perhaps mastered what it meant to be a clown. Mm. But the costume had very little to do with him. I think he maybe stylized the makeup a little bit in his own way. These traditional diamond cheeks, you know, mm. and this weird proboscis on the forehead. It was quite common, which again is a reptilian feature, which is very strange, a proboscis on the head. Um, but yeah, he actually, he didn't create the costume. It was the son of a Freemason called Charles Dibden. Uh, Charles Dibden. Mm. And honestly, my wife is sick of hearing me say this name. I know she is Charles Dibden. It's, it's not stop. <laughs> but here's the father and here's the son. Right. You know? Okay. Um, and that's basically how we went. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well. So yeah, this is just the the Nephilim spirits, spirits of the Nephilim living through these performers. Um, that's right. That's right. And the no, that's that's the one side of my research what I've just given you there. That's what actually the first book is all about, pretty much everything I've just said there. Um, it's explaining the the historical history we can know for a fact that shows that the, the hand of Freemasonry has been there since the inception of the costume of a clown and circuses. Okay. Now, circuses are another thing, you know. Yes. Um, and that, that, that's a whole other and the rest of my the good middle portion of my book is about that too. Um mm -hmm. And that's I kind of round off at the end of my my book talking about um, DMT trips, DMT jesters, and also some clown societies out there who who are specifically have shamans who act like and dress like clowns and have done for millennia, you know, um, to channel ancestor spirits. And I'm I'm leaving the book there because the second half of my research isn't the history necessarily, but it's an anthropological study of ancestor spirit worship cultures found all around the earth. Which okay. also, which wear masks like you see on the screen there, to um, to um, channel the ancestors, you know, ch channel the the nephilim. So I do I do have some images I could probably show you here. I think it's on rolling images, and we'll go to we'll go to um, one of the middle ones. Let's go to clown five, and I've just got a compilation of images, you know, that mm. kind of show this that no matter what culture you go to, there are always depicting these things the same mm -hmm. even royalty as you can see here is always depicted the pale white skin and wild red hair motif and the mm -hmm. royalty believe themselves to be descendants of the nephilim you know to have Indeed. the divine right to rule um here's the theum in india now where this theum character dresses like this psychedelic monster here um mm -hmm. for the village in order to channel the demons and then the people give sacrifices to the demon and the person channeling the demon has to eat the live chicken they've just been given as a sacrifice you know mm -hmm. to please right. to please the demon's satiation for blood and all these type of things and in return they get knowledge they get information you know here's the day of the dead ritual from uh, i think it's beijing Okay. Um, here's the creepy clown sightings of 2016. Yes. You know, yeah, I recall were, that. Yeah, yeah. And I think they were hinting to us, you know, oh, the Nephilim are about to return in some way or something like that. Here's the uh, fight of Con. This is the Day of the Dead ritual in, uh, I think it's, I think it's Thailand actually, I'm, um, Bangkok, and yeah, around that region. And this is what they do: they dress like the spirits of the dead. Mm -hmm. And look at these big, wide grinned, toothed terrifying looking jester looking monsters with multicolored fractal ribbon clothing to represent their etheric 
spiritualistic psychedelic mm. clown looking nature you know this is serpent skin being represented this is mm. this is not dissimilar from morris dancers in england who dress the same way you know what i mean mm. um and there's the Thaim again. The demon, the man is now possessed by the demon, and the villages are like, "Whoa, what's going on?" You know? mm, right. um, you'll find you'll find it goes every culture. I mean, even here, the wild red headdress of the um, red nose of feathers with the red nose. This is a Papua New Guinea tribe. Um, mm. This is the Wanjinas of Australia. These mm. are the rain gods. These are the children of the rainbow serpents from the Kimberley region of Australia. They literally look like clowns. Like they, they are not even. It's not even yeah. funny how much yeah. they look like a clown. You know, that's quite yeah. literally what they look like. And again, that's that's the Australians' stylistic way of describing the creatures, the offspring of rainbow serpents. That's the fiery flying serpents, the seraphim angels who mated with women and created offspring. These are mm. the Nephilim by Australian standards. You know, mm. and they look like clowns. There's the serpent with their offspring. There you, you know? go um and here's modern clowns and the modeled after the modeled after the same thing this is where the inspiration comes from there's the red nose again um more about the creepy clown sightings mm. uh, yeah one guy in particular too comes to mind that i saw you mentioned was uh baron semedi yes is that the, yeah okay of haiti i believe that's haiti that's of haitian voodoo culture yeah so ba baron yeah. semedi it actually comes from an older tradition coming out of africa okay. um I can't remember the specific reach off the top of my head right now. I'm blanking on it, but it, it, it came over to Haiti with the colonization by the French when they brought their slaves over with them. Mm. So it's kind of, and it got mixed with the Freemasonry and Catholicism, which the French also brought over to Haiti. Okay. So Haitian voodoo is a mix of all three of those odd religions all kind of amalgamated together, you know, so okay. you're looking idol worship similar to catholicism mixed in with haitian voodoo you get the ancestor spirit worship over from africa with haitian voodoo but a lot of the symbols and sigils and satan satanic spirit veneration worship they get is from freemasonry mm -hmm. so you'll find baron semedi is at the hat man he wears this top yes. hat he? you know when has a cigar and drinks his rum and the whole purpose of dressing that way is to channel the spirit of baron semedi which is one of the iwas which is like um they have the pantheon of ancestor spirit gods, and he's just one of them. And to please the spirit, you dress like him to be possessed by him. And once you're possessed by the spirit of Baron Semedi, you smoke cigars and drink wine to please him, to feed him, to satiate his hungers and thirsts. And then as a result, you get power, witchcraft. You know, you get you get things in return for it, um, earthly powers. And that was kind of the point of why people do this, why these ancestor spirit cultures even do this to begin with. It's a transactionary thing. You know, you 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 let the demon possess you. You give it stuff by drinking things and smoking things so it can experience through your body these pleasures. Because it doesn't have a body anymore. Remember this. The Nephilim are now right. disembodied spirits. They used to be kings and rulers. They mm. used to have power and authority over everything. They used to cannibalize us and eat us. Um, they had everything at their fingertips. All power was onto mm. them, you know, and it got taken away from them. And their souls got stuck here. So they now live in a disembodied state, hungering and thirsting in the dry places with no physical body to quench those hungers or thirsts. They're in hell. They're in hell. You know, they are in a seriously horrible situation that they are struggling to cope with. And what they do is they possess us so that we can feed their senses through mm -hmm. our senses. They use our senses to experience stuff. That's what possession mm -hmm. is, you know. Yeah, like hence, we, hence we get the idea where people will say, oh, he has a de demon of gambling. He has a demon of lust. He has a demon of alcoholism. Yeah, well, he has it's a demon in him who enjoys doing those things, I would say. Right. That's the more realistic way of saying it. Mm -hmm. And he will use you as a means to get that pleasure. You know, mm -hmm. and, and in some, most, some most demons are really sick, you know, they'll kill people. They'll want they'll want you to murder on their behalf as well, because they get pleasure out of that. You know, that's the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. Um it's messed up, but sorry, go ahead, I'll let you speak. I'll just oh no, not at all. I don't wanna I mean this is just a ton of information. And the one thing I like about your research is coming from a place where, you know, you were largely unchurched, right? Mm -hmm. Growing up, you came, as you mentioned before, I heard you say a backdoor Christian, which in a lot of ways, you know, you're not, um, I don't want to say brainwashed. I don't want to offend my brothers and sisters and, you know, in faith, 
that have been raised in the church, but there's a lot of things that the seminaries just don't teach and that the churches aren't exposed to. Hence, mm. where do demons come from? Um, so I think getting into things like this is beneficial for people who in general, and especially people who do, you know, um, sit in the pews on Sunday, that they're just not hearing, you know, where these ideas come from, that in fact, these are spirits of deceased giant clans, the mm-hmm. likes of which David and his men were, were fighting the likes of which Joshua oh, were, yeah. were up against. Uh, we hear these stories and it's just like, oh yeah, the giants. Yeah. But no, these are, this is they where look, this comes from. This is they look Jesus, like this. Yeah. Yeah, this is who Jesus, he not only came to die for sins, but this is who he came to defeat, to defeat these lords of the dead, you know, to defeat death itself. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, not to not to cut you off there. Uh, no, no, absolutely. But, you're you're but, right. Yeah. A lot of people don't just don't understand how terrifying these creatures actually were, you know, mm-hmm. and what they were actually dealing with were, were dragon human mm-hmm. hybrids. Imagine that, you know, mm-hmm. giant versions of these monstrous reptilian hybrid divine entity with mixed with human beasts you know they were they were truly right. horrific you know it was there's there's nothing like them you know and no wonder they they subjugated and became the kings and rulers of everything because how could you stand up to these things originally you know right. and like you right. said most of the old testament is the expulsion of these things after the flood getting rid getting rid of the remnants that made it somehow afterwards and uh, mm. you know I've, I've speculated in my book how all that happened and it's really complicated mm. biblical history maybe i recommend reading the book when i publish it to get all those details yes. but we know they were before and after you know, yes. and that's what I'm saying. Like I said, Joshua and David were, were wiping the remnants out, reclaiming mm. back the lands they, for some reason, chose to dwell in, which was Canaan, you know. Um, and they looked like monsters. They were truly terrifying things to behold. And they inspired mm. a lot of cultures because they built most of these cultures to maintain a veneration of them through ritual. And what mm. you're seeing on screen here are remnants of these ancient rituals, which were inspired by the Nephilim when they were around, you know, mm. so you're getting a glimpse through these rituals of what they used to actually look like. This is humans trying to emulate them, mm. trying to be like them, you know, and obviously today they dress like them in order to be possessed by the spirits of them. Cause that's mm. all you could do now, you know, and every culture has their own way of doing it. Yeah, explain that a little bit. You mentioned how that's a, I believe the word you used was um, previously, as I saw you in an interview, was mirror, mirror to the spirit realm. Yeah, so so it's a channel. Okay, so when you, when you dress like something, it's far more complicated than you actually originally think it's going to be. You think in the West, we think it's harmless to dress like anything. We don't think Halloween's that serious. It's something for the kids, you know what I mean? But the Celts understood that. Savoyne, which is what Halloween is based upon, was the time when the veil between the spirit realm and the physical realm was at its thinnest. So if we dress like something during Sarwain when this veil is thin, what you're essentially doing is creating a strong portal through the clothes you're wearing to the thing in the spirit realm that looks the same. Okay. And that's what the point of dressing like something is in these cultures. They dress like the thing to open a strong channel to be possessed by the thing. Mm. That's what they do. That's the purpose of, of doing this in a lot of these cultures, especially in Africa. They are so into ancestor spirit worship. They dress like their ancestors to be possessed by the ancestors i mean this one in here with polka dots all over the face you know and again we're not just talking about you know your grandmother your grandfather we're talking no. their idea of ancestors is these gods is these yes. entities they don't mean they do not mean grandma and granddad no that's a that's a translation issue for us we just don't have another word for it mm. uh, but that's not what they mean that's not who they mean by ancestors they they mean ancient rulers the old ones you know, mm-hmm. the, the builders of their civilizations and cultures and religions. They're going mm-hmm. way back to the Nephilim here when they do ancestor spirit worship. Uh, but then in the West, the wild man tradition is, is a little bit different. We we think of it as something as apotropaic. OK, and that's a fancy word for basically saying we think you dress like demons to scare them away. OK, mm-hmm. we are so fooled to believe that. Mm. That is ridiculous. It's stupid thinking. And people argue with me that how can you say something like that? That's offensive to the cultures who do this. And I'm saying, look, it can't work both ways, right? There are cultures out there who specifically dress like this for the sole intention and purpose of being possessed by the demon. 
Okay. Mm. They know that's why they do it. They'll tell you that's why they're doing it. Now, you can't also dress like a demon then to scare them away. Only one of you can be right. Mm. And it's that's not the people, point. it's not the people thinking they're scaring them away. It's not. Mm. They have been heavily fooled to believe that. And I th I'd say that's Satan's way of creeping uh, possession into the Western world, you know. Mm. And this is, for example, this is the Kuretos in Portugal. This is their version of the wild man tradition. And they okay. know that they know they were in the costumes of devils. And they even say that their personalities change when they do this. And they run around the village causing chaos for one night, you know, and knocking on people's doors, harassing young women, shaking their bells in front of young women, all sorts of things, you know. Um, mm. And they say they lose themselves to it, their identity and everything. And then they fast afterwards like it was nothing, you know. But this is just their way of, of allowing the demons in for one night in Europe to have moments of excess and drink and get that pleasure from us that they, that they want. All these rituals and these cultures that these people are doing is feeding demons who are in the dry places just wanting to have something. You know? <laughs> it's mm. actually... It does nothing but aid them. And it's kind of... We just don't know that. We don't understand the nature of wearing a costume and its spiritual implications because we think there's something completely separate from one another but these cultures in africa like this one they know exactly why they're doing this mm. you know they know the purpose yeah and, and i think for a lot of westerners these are hard truths because we grow up with our traditions and what yeah. we think is just innocent fun but when we take a deep dive into these these subjects these topics we see that um they're rooted in in this supernatural war that goes back thousands of years. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. You know, and, yeah. and there's a drawing I did years ago, trying to, trying to figure out what they would look like <laughs> based on the skulls, the elongated skulls we find. Mm. Um, maybe not so much that maybe they would have looked a bit more colorful than that though. I'll say that much. Right. Uh, but here's, good. here's, here's like, here's like the cookery in Bulgaria, very psychedelic diamond colored patterns. Now the reasons they look like this. Okay. Oh, by the way, just on a side note, this is top fashion of 20 to of 2003 2004 this is the runways the clown core they're trying to they're trying to normalize it as fashion mm. and this is literally on runways and what trickles down from the runways a year or two later is a watered down version of what you see here and these will be in the outlet stores soon something like this harlequin inspired t-shirts and clown circus inspired tops and jeans and whatever you know but make no mistake, they're trying to get the general public to dress like clowns. Now, why? Why would they do something so stupid and ridiculous? Because the more people they have dressing like clowns, the more channels they have opened up to the spirit realm. Okay, the more power we are giving over to the demonic, who these secret societies work with. Mm. You know, that's how it works. So they're, they're convincing. I mean, clown core is a real fashion trend. A lot of people mm. on TikTok are really into it. Clown core fashion, you know, a lot of teenagers, a lot of Gen Z are into it as well. And it's becoming a legitimate fashion choice. And like mm. I said, they are pushing it on you through the mainstream. They want mm. you to dress that way. Every few years, there's a reboot of Stephen King's It or The Joker. There's a new Joker or something. Why? Because they want people at Halloween dressing like clowns. Mm. it's simple it's very simple you know here's the geishas for example white skin red lips um black and white fractal lines you know this is their version they are entertainers by nature the geishas that's their job mm. serpent skin you know it's that's all this is a representation of the nephilim had serpentine skin inherited from their fiery flying serpent fathers so they look something like this they also inherited incredibly wide jaws from the snake seraphim fathers Snakes can dislocate their jaws in order to eat their prey. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah, didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's why yeah. the Nephilim also had very, very wide grins. They could probably also dislocate their jaws and devour people quite easily. Um, here's Medusa. This is what Medusa truly looked like. This is a Gorgon on Greek pottery. Okay. You no, know, but everyone thinks of Medusa. Oh, that's that green snake lady with snake yeah, hair. Snake. Yeah. That's not what she looked like. Okay. That's a, that's a modern film interpretation of medusa this is what medusa looked like okay she had wild knotted red hair pale white skin prominent black brow ridges a big wide grin mm. with long sticking out and huge bulging eyes she it, this is the greek european version of the rakshasa demon i showed you earlier from india okay it's and what is medusa she is the offspring of a chidna the mother of monsters, by the way. She birthed many monsters. 
and Echidna was a siren. It says in the Book of Enoch that the women who mated with the fallen angels became sirens. Mm -hmm. okay. Explain now, what a siren is. Yes. So to become a siren, you, you basically become a half-woman, half-animal hybrid. Okay. So okay. most sirens are mermaids, for example, or harpies, which are half-bird, half-woman, or um, the nagas of India, which are half-serpents, half-woman. Now, a chidna was a two-snake-legged woman. She was a woman on top, but a serpent on bottom. On the bottom, she was a siren. Okay, mm. she mated with the fallen angels and created offspring. Many, many monsters. Many of them. Her particular partner was Typhon, a sea serpent god monster thing. Basically, a seraphim angel, just a, a, a serpent, a sea serpent version of it. And she produced the Gorgons. Medusa being one of the three. And here's Medusa. She is a serpent god, snake god, hybrid with a siren woman. A woman, hu a human woman who got turned into a siren. So she is a quintessential Nephilim. That's what she is. And this is what they look like. Looks like a, looks like a clown, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, here's another version. They don't have snakes for hair, like we see in all modern interpretations, like Jason and the Argonauts from like the 60s or something. That's just a modern twist. Mm. They look. They looked more human. In fact, most representations, she has wings. Mm. It's very odd, you know. Um, there's Pedrolino in its original form. He is more runaway fashion. Mm -hmm. And here's the serpentine frill around the mm. neck of a lizard. That's why clowns wear ruffs around the neck. It's this, it's a serpent feature again. It's the same mm. thing. There's an example of ruffs around the neck. Mm. Um, you find it everywhere. Across all yeah. cultures, this is a, this is the European flavor, you know, with pom poms, like another clownish thing as well, looking like party hats. In the yeah. Americas, especially, you know, here's the Aztec god with the tongue sticking out. This is their gorgon at the center of the calendar. It's the same mm. thing. Um, so here's in this is China. This is a another ancestor spirit or a general, as they were called them, but just an ancient god. Um, there's the queen, <laughs> classic. Mm. Uh, she actually died, funnily enough, because of lead poisoning from the face paint she would put on. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Sad, sad end, really. It, it was all for no end. But yeah, like I said, a lot of cult. That's just, I've only scratched the surface there. Yeah. Yeah. All all cultures do this. They all have mm. their own version. The one, I think the one Gina are a favorite of mine of, um, so they have these rock paintings here. And what they do is the, the myth goes when a one Gina died, they mm. would enter a cave and they would do a self portrait. <laughs> so that's why they have them here. And all these car rock paintings in in uh, Australia, and mm. it's it, the shaman is allowed to go in every year and repaint them and keep them fresh, mm. but it has to be done by a specific shaman who's allowed to do it of the tribe, okay. you know. And uh, look at them, look at them. These things, these things are clowns, mm. quite literally a clown. You know, there's no other way around it, mm. um, and it's. Yeah, I'm not making this up. It's like, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Because believe me, I know what this sounds like. I'm not stupid. Right, right, you know? <laughs> I do right. understand how wild this seems initially. Oh, yeah. Like the yeah. interview you were doing with Gary when you had mentioned you just in the intro, you would say, you know, some of your, he was talking about, you know, wanting to maybe look into some of your work. And um, you yeah. had mentioned, and I just heard Nephilim's clown. And I'm like, what is this? What is he talking about? But, I, you know, I like going down the rabbit hole. So I started watching some things on your channel and i just yeah i was like wow this is where this concept comes from especially Absolutely. with you know when you see the charles dibden and dibden jr and his trip to india and coming i mean it's right there it so, is it's right in your face it, it always has yeah. been as well which is the the really shocking thing about all this you know what i mean it's not i mean look this is another gorgon on greek pottery this is on the chest of athena mm. look at that what is that that's a, a clown. clownish figure, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a clown by any stretch of the imagination, you know what I mean? You can't right. even get around it, and that's that's Medusa. Right. The, story, the story goes that Medusa was beheaded by Perseus, okay? And as a gift to Athena, he gave it to her. And she wears the head of Medusa on her chest as mm. a talisman for good luck, okay? Mm. And that's what that is on her chest on pottery. That's what it looked like in that particular piece of pottery. No, here's the he's the um, the there's the Hayoka tribe of the Sioux people, um, and they have the clown the clown uh, 
character here, the Hayoka character within the Sioux peoples, you know, the ritual. Uh, the Hayoka is based off a thunder god, but they dress like this and act backwards to society. And they have black and white fractal lines all over them, big red shoes, and they dress like clowns. These are clown mm. societies. They exist everywhere. Anthropologists call them this because that's just the only way we can describe what they do. But the clown mm. character, or the, the person who does this, is considered extremely important, like a shaman of high order in the society, you know. And I guess what the Freemasons did is they've traveled all around the world throughout the, the years and they saw numerous examples. I mean, look how wide this grin is on this painting. That's so unnatural. Mm. You know, humans don't look like that. They knew what they were doing in these old artworks, you know. But mm. I do believe the Freemasons traveled, saw all these different representations of their gods, the Nephilim, and they kind of took a feature from each and mashed it all together and created a clown. You know, what we call a clown. Mm -hmm. So you'll always see similar, a, similar, a similar vein of features kind of coalescing throughout all these different cultures into, into the symbol of a clown. Here's a one in stilts, an ancestor spirit worship ritual where they were stilts in Africa. And clowns often were stilts. It's a reference to them being giants, you mm -hmm. know, which is what they used to be. Um, yeah, it's quite creepy. I mean, look at it. The, India's full of it. <laughs> they love it over there. Um and then they get back in Europe again, Africa, mm -hmm. uh, the insane clown posse <laughs> mm -hmm. doing yeah. their own thing. Look at this one. Look, I mean, look at these party hats they're wearing. It makes you wonder where we get our version of a party hat from. You know? Yeah, that's right. Ki that kids were at parties. It looks like that's it's from, right. these, from these old motifs, you know? Right. Um, there we go again. It's just the, the traditions of man, which are rooted in the Nephilim. In the worship of the Nephilim. The yeah. worship of the Nephilim, yeah. Yeah, here he is with the red nose again. Now, it's funny, you know, the base of a clown is white skin, red hair. That's pretty much the common description of all Nephilim throughout history, you know. Mm -hmm. And glowing eyes is another common one as well. Six fingers, six toes is another common one. So the base of a clown is white skin, red hair. That's the base. You build on that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, here's another Rakshasa demon from India. Pale white skin, fiery red hair, you know, multiple arms, cannibalistic giants that tore humans apart with for fun, you know, mm -hmm. big bulging guys. Um, here's a mating ritual from Africa where the males are trying to attract females by having a wide grin and showing the whites of their eyes. So they look like they're glowing, very odd. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a beauty standard. Where did they get this beauty standard from? And also the tallest males as well. They have to jump really high to show how tall they are. So trying to emulate something, aren't they? And then obviously in our culture, we have Red Nose Day where they get everybody for charity for the kids, right? To dress up like a clown. Yeah, that's coming up, I believe. I did got... look when you mentioned it. I I Googled that and I think it's this. I think it's the, it's coming the 15th or 19th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, you got to wonder why they're making us do these things now. Mm -hmm. You have to wonder what's the source of all this, really. Now, the Red Nose is an interesting one, actually, because... Um, I, I believe it's a, it was a real Nephilim feature for a very specific reason. Now, if you get rosacea, okay, so you get this blotchy red patches all over the skin, okay, mm. and it's predominantly a Caucasian issue. It shows up more on Caucasians for obvious reasons because we have pale skin. Sure. And now any race can get it, but it's predominantly a white person problem, okay? But every race can get this genetic condition. Okay. It's a genetic condition. You don't catch it. You don't get it by drinking too much or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, you just you just either have it or you don't. And it's predominant in white people so much that they call it the curse of the Celts. Okay. Mm. Pale people with pale skin tend to get this problem. All right. Now the Nephilim had the palest skin. They had white, deathly pale skin like paper, mm. like vampires. It's highly likely they also had this condition due to this. Mm. Okay. And they would have had multicolored splotches like polka dots all over their skin. Mm. Okay. Which is why we emulate that. And not to mention the fact that they would have had multicolored patterns all over there by virtue of being part snake as well. Serpents are very colorful. So they would have looked nuts with this. Now, one side effect of rosacea is what you see here, a rhino fiber. You see this name, Rhino Fiber? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what it, this is called, and they call it end stage rosacea because it's the most extreme form of rosacea. Okay. Mm. Rosacea, Rhino Fiber. 
And what happens? Your nose gets big. It gets very bulbous and very red. Mm. Like a clown nose. Mm. Okay. But it's highly likely speculation here, but rooted in scientific evidence. Sure. You know, if they, had, if they had incredibly pale skin and likely developed the curse of the Celts as a result, in extreme cases, they would have developed incredibly large, bulbous red noses. And mm. that's the most common thing you associate with a clown. Mm. So I mean, speculative, but based on all of the other evidence, yeah. intriguing. <laughs> Absolutely. So I do think there's something to it. I do yeah. think it's a true physical thing to this. And mm. the myth is alcoholics get this problem okay but mm. that person must drink too much alcohol and is at the pub every weekend you know knocking back six pints that's what old men who drink too much get this problem nope completely genetic uh, it's, okay. it's a real genetic condition that you can only get if you are predisposed with the genetic marker okay, okay. you don't get it because you drink too much it's such an it's an urban myth to believe that it's just utterly false and the only way to fix it is to literally shave it off with a hot wire. Re sculpt the entire nose back mm. into shape. That's the only way you get rid of it. There's no other way. Uh, so there you go. I think that's where the red nose comes from. I think that's why clowns have red noses. I think it's another reference to a literal feature they actually would have had in mm. a true sense. And here they are trying to get everybody to mimic yeah. that feature. The more they can get people dressing with clownish features, the stronger channel they open to the spirit yes. realm to allow them in. It's that simple. Yes. So they have mm. festivals all throughout Europe where they dress like clowns. This is the Basler Fastnach. We call them carnivals. You have mm. them in America, which have been brought to them from Europe and from Africa. Yeah. You have, uh, you know, well, um, New Orleans, for example, has quite a big one, doesn't it? You know, Mardi Gras, they're yes. everywhere. And that's what these have their roots in. It's 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 the veneration <laughs> of um, the Nephilim. And it comes out of the wild man traditions. Mm. They, at the excess party of dressing like the demon before fasting and before lent mm. you know these these are just modern iterations of these ancient thracian dionysius worship wild man worshiping cults and the wild man is the european version of the nephilim it's the europeans rakshasa you know mm. it's the same thing and that's where we get harlequin that's where we get the clown it's all it's all connected you know and they ha even in like i said the americas they had totem poles that are covered in these things in media they're always pushing it on us as much as they can with the similar motifs um sure. it, it never ends it honestly never ends the research just keeps going and going and going and you go to every continent they've got their own representations of these things yes. Um, yes. there's a common thread they all have their own stylistic aesthetic yes they all have their own way of doing it but the common themes become undeniable the further you go. And you have to wonder, why do all the Shriners have a clown section? Yeah. All Shriners dress like clowns. Right, the Shriner what, clowns, what is, yeah. what is What is a Middle Eastern-themed cult doing associating with Western clowns? Mm. Why? Oh, well, it's to go entertain the dying kids at the Shriner hospitals, right? To raise money for charity? No, I don't think so. It's because secret societies venerate the Nephilim. They work with the Nephilim. And this is their way of publicly being able to dress like their gods and channel them without the public recognizing it because the mm. clown has been programmed to be something for the kids to us. Mm. It's subtle. It's sneaky. Yeah. You know? And I heard you mention too, which uh, it reminds me when you said in the West, that's it's kind of hard to grapple with. But in other places... This is it's understood the supernatural world, uh, how channeling is done, mirroring all this yes. sounds to a lot of us, you know, in the West is, oh, this is crazy conspiratorial nonsense. But there's a large part of the world who are like, yeah, welcome to the party, guys. <laughs> you know, this is yeah, what yeah. we've we know this. This is yeah. this is reality going back since creation. It's majority of Western world versus the rest of the world thing. Mm. The rest of the world seems to know, you know, but uh, the highly Christianized nations don't have a clue, mm. you know. And it, look, here's here's the one Gina right next to a modern clown. You know, this this is it. That's what you're looking at right now. It's just our mm. version of it. It's the mm. same creature, you know. And they're getting people to dress like one Gina's. They're getting people to dress like the offspring of rainbow serpents. They're getting people to dress like Nephilim. That's mm. what they're doing, and we're programmed to believe it's just something fun for the kids you know we were naive so you know when circuses came around originally 
they um they were all run by Freemasons, still are today pretty much in America. I think the Ringling Bros run it today, P.T. Barnum and the Ringling Bros Combined Circus. And the Shriners run most of the traveling circuses in America today as well. So it's still kept within secret societies. But you have to understand, the first three-ring circus was created by uh, P.T. Barnum, and he was a member of the Oddfellows. It's no coincidence that the logo for the Oddfellows is three interlocking rings. Um Oddfellows is a sect of or a, Freemas a Freemasonry. Freemasons, okay. It's their version of free. It's another sect of Freemasonry here. As you can see, the three interlocking rings in the center. Mm. Okay. And you have the three ring circus. The three ring circus, exactly. You know, and P <laughs> I mean... P.T. Barnum was there from the beginning in the development of the modern um, circus in America. You know, and he's the one who brought the freak show into it as well. Uh, okay. P.T. Barnum. Um. And obviously, The Greatest Showman, that film's based on his life, but it's a very generous take on what he actually was. He was a cruel man. He was an and evil there you, man. Um, if you might want to share with the viewers, too, the man right there uh, in the in the highlighted photo with the hat, the top hat, and yeah, so how he, in the Masonic the Lodge, they have the top hat. Yeah, so you have the ringmaster, don't you, mm -hmm. of any circus. Mm -hmm. This guy. Well, this is the Freemason. This is the Grand Worshipful Master. Let's look uh, at him. Oh, sorry, it's the wor worship. <laughs> these stupid <laughs> names. Worshipful Grand right. Master of a lodge. Right. Yeah, most worshipful Grand Master. That's this go. guy. You know, that's what this is. So you have to understand, the most worshipful Grand Master of a lodge is the one who's only allowed to wear a black top hat. Nobody mm. else in the lodge is allowed to wear one. Only the most worshipful Grand Master. And he orchestrates the rituals in a Freemason lodge, which I believe behind closed doors are actually just Nephilim veneration and summoning rituals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now in a circus, the ringmaster orchestrates the clowns, mm. the ritual of the circus and right. the clown and the clowns are representations of demons. The Nephilim It's the, it's a Freemason ritual on a grand public scale hidden behind layers of nuance and symbolism it's the same thing and you'll find in the 1800s they did it i mean look here for example there's even a film called the ringmaster which is playing on the fact that it's a reference to the nephilim clown situation you know what i mean right. and people are always playing on this but you have to understand that one of the earliest um, shows put together was uh, king solomon and the queen of sheba circus um and it was an epic put together by, I think, like 10 different circuses, all of them Freemasons. Okay. Okay. A true, the 10 truly good shows merged into one. King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. You know, when we're talking about here, the Freemasons love Solomon. They're obsessed with him because sure. they want to build it, rebuild his temple and all these type of things. He was the one who used demons to build the temple, you know, with his ring, the ring master. The ring mm. leader, the Lord of the Ring. You mm. know, that's what the Grand Masterful Worshipper of a Lodge is trying to be, a Solomon analog. That's what the ringmaster of a circus is, the Solomon analog. And you know, right. and he said that, you know, his foreign wives brought with them the foreign religions and therefore the demons as well. And it's also all these it's all there in this show. Yeah. Every and single the idea in the extra biblical narratives where Solomon controlled the demons with the ring, which exactly. a lot of again, a lot of Western Christians aren't aware of that. Where it's like we're not exposed to this. We're told, you know, don't go down, don't learn that. Don't or for me, a lot of that is fear that, oh well, you're gonna you're gonna wind up, you know, worshiping the devil, where it's, for me it's just knowing the enemy. It's, yeah, it's you know, which so exactly. Well, if you look here, not wrangling bros, um, people think, oh, well, that's because they're all brothers. Yes, it does mean that, but you know what it also means? They're all members of the lodge, they're all brothers, mm, they're all the Freemasons. So it means to be a brother, you are a Freemason. Um, and you'll find all 10 of the circuses involved in putting together this huge epic show that traveled the entire country of America, all of them Freemasons. All the backdrops, all the costumes were created by the Anderson Arms Company. Uh, might have spelled that wrong. Is it Arms? Anderson Arms Company. I can't find it. Anyway, it's, it's a disbanded company now. It doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, but the, the Anderson Arms Company built all the um, costumes for Freemason lodges. All the pins, the badges, the bibs they wear. 
um, all the costumes for Freemasons were for the rituals. The Anderson Arms Company is the one that made them. Uh, I can't believe I can't find the name because again, they don't exist anymore, but they do exist in history. As like, um, I'm sure it's the Andy Anderson Arms Company. Let's go Freemasonry and see what comes up eventually. Um, I want to do images. Uh, arms. I think you've typed arms again. Um, yeah, I think. Arm. It, I, I'm pretty sure it was the Anderson Arms Company, but oh, uh, okay. I, I'm missing the information here. Anyway, they were all the ones who created all the costumes for this Queen of Sheba show. Okay. okay. Um, and they created all the backdrops as well. The posters were created by um, a, a famous Freemason from England, an artist as well. Everything about this is a Freemason run epic. You know, mm. and also, and that's what I mean. Circuses have always been a Freemason thing. They always, mm. they, they've never not been, you know, uh, especially America in America. But like I said, the first British version of this, which had the name Circus in it, Charles Dibden, he's the one who created it. You know, right. um, it's right. always been, it's always been a Freemason affair, and everything involved with it has been too. And the reason mm -hmm. is they are the the modern version of mystery wisdom schools from the antediluvian past. They are the right. physical foot soldiers for the physical for the for the spiritual realm. They work on behalf in the physical realm for the demons. They work on behalf of them and the demons in the spiritual realm, or they answer to their fathers, the angels. There's a hierarchy, you know, and you can't, you, uh, you know, you can't trust these people as far as you can throw them. And from the very beginning, you know, let I me mean, look at this, for example, that's a giant. Right. <laughs> they put it in the posters. Right. That is literally a giant picking animals up to do God knows what with them, right? Eat them perhaps. Hmm. Yeah, they always represented giant the the clowns as giants among hmm. the big top tents because that's what the nephilim were they're, they're telling you outright they're laughing about it you know what i mean they're yeah. laughing in your face about these things and they always have it's a big joke to them because they know we're so stupid we'll never figure it out <laughs> we have now you know and the yeah. thing is circuses are old hat the the they've died as a dying art form it's, it's practically dead you know but hmm. you have to understand the clowns just move to the tv and now they right. move to mainstream and now musicians dress like clowns you know i mean look at bloody david mm -hmm. for example you know yeah it, i did write that down to ask you about that too as well <laughs> yeah with the entertainment industry yeah i mean he was a prime example of trying to look as much like a nephilim as he could mm. you know and that's the point if you want to make it big in the industry dress like a psychedelic clown monster <laughs> it doesn't matter if your music doesn't matter if your music's good or not the freemasons <laughs> will pick you up and they'll put you in front of an audience because you can then become an idol and idols get emulated. The more mm. people who emulate you who dress like that, then the more people, the channels they can open. That's all it's about. It's about opening more and more channels, you know, mm -hmm. and the, the music industry is just absolutely rife with this. And um, I don't, do I have a file dedicated? I might actually have a folder dedicated to this somewhere um, that I did recently. Give me a second. Sure. Uh, YouTube. Might be in here. I've got lots. I've just, just I'm at, my computer's a mess. I'm not gonna no, lie. I, I get it. I can imagine. Yeah. But I'm I'm constantly compiling more and more stuff. But uh, hmm. I must I must have something. You know, I've got I've, I've got nothing in here. This is a terrifying version of the Gorgon, by the way. I found. Look at these things. Hmm. There's Medusa again. Okay. Quintessential clown face right there. You know what I mean? Absolutely terrifying. I just thought I'd show you that. But I do, I do have a folder <laughs> dedicated to the music somewhere on here. Um, mm -hmm. Videos. We've got Gary Wayne's images there. Uh, mm -hmm. Music. Ah, okay. So we might be getting somewhere here. Let's just see what comes up as I go through these. But you'll find the music industry are the new versions of the clowns of the theatres and the clowns of the circuses. Um, yes. they, they dress this way to channel in order for fame and fortune, but also to give the Nephilim that thing they once used to have veneration and glory. They used to be Kings and rulers, you know? So to dress like this and be on stage is to give the pleasure over to the, to the clown, you know, but also I do believe a lot of musicians who sell their soul for rock and roll, let's say they dress this way to channel the demons so they can actually be a good musician. <laughs> sure. I mean, they come out you know? more and more and admit that you hear that. And yeah. um, again, most people in the West don't, you know, goes one ear out the other. Beyonce is telling you she becomes Sasha fierce and yeah. um, Nicki Minaj is telling you she has 35 personalities and 
Yeah. I mean, they're, they're telling us this, but without knowing the history, it's just, oh, there, that's crazy. That's, or that's not serious. That's just something they go through, something that in their artistry. No, nope. but <laughs> absolutely not. Right. No, they they're doing exactly what the people in Africa and India were doing. They're dressing like the thing to be possessed by the thing for power. Mm. It's the same, and they're practice. receiving the veneration. I mean, there yes. people you know see their favorite star and they're bawling. You know, oh my god, you know, I love you. I mean, they're basically worshiping. Yeah. a lot of times. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's the point. That's the point of it is to give over that power to the, the, the person who's channeling the demon, you mm. know, and the demon within feels it. <laughs> they feel what the person's feeling, you know, and they're getting that hit that they used to get when they used to be venerated as gods themselves. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, and it's, it's, it never stopped, you know, here's a mm. fashion industry going at it again. They're draining energy in a way too. Yeah. There's energy, especially when you have a crowd full of people, when you have thousands in a stadium, there's so much energy. People will talk about vibrational energy and they can yeah. feel the energy. Well, imagine, you know, something feeding off of all that energy. Absolutely. Well, look, here's the wild man tradition of Portugal, the Kuretos, as I showed you earlier, you know, mm. um, ancient practice of wild men traditions this goes way back this is very old celtic as well you know it goes way back to the celtic culture and here's elton john on stage dressed the same way mm. <laughs> okay they know right. what they're doing they're not idiots right. and i we, love elton john you know. again a lot of this is hard <laughs> truths you know there's some great music there's great things out there but then you learn where this is all rooted in and it's just like wow there's nothing new under the sun we're just no. duplicating old rituals yeah, there's Beyonce being worshipped as a god, quite literally. You know, and she's she's again wearing shiny patterned clothing like serpent skin to uh, channel the Nephilim. Oh. Um, Prince was another example. Nicki Minaj always dressing as colorful and psychedelic as she possibly can. There we go. Another red haired pale skin monster with share there. But these people go on forever because they've signed deals. They never retire. They have to remain useful, or they get killed. That's how it mm. works. Either you're a liability or you're an asset. Which one do you want to be? And that's why you have these performers performing until until they're dead, till like the late seventies when they should have retired years ago. You know, because they're not allowed to retire. They signed a deal, mm. and uh, it's kind of sad, really, when you think about it. Yeah, the interview with Bob Dylan makes it clear. He's telling he's I signed a deal with the chief of this world, and yeah. it's just like, what is he talking about? But <laughs> you, you got to keep spreading the message, or what use are you to us? You know too much. We'll just kill you. You know, mm -hmm. um, it's that simple. And that's, that's, that's why these people get put into positions of extreme adulation and fame because they want people to copy them. Oh, if I want to get famous in the music industry, I guess I have to dress like a clown. You know, <laughs> that's what David Bowie did. It worked for him, you know, and that's what people do. They copy it and it only creates more and more channels. It just makes it even more uh, popular as, as, as a way of doing things and you'll find every generation of musicians have had the same thing it happens mm. all the time you know and you'll find similar motifs and what the musicians do to what these ancestor spirit culture cultures do in in a very serious way you know they're not mm. they're not messing around um i just yeah i've got no, some of these pictures by the way will be irrelevant because they're from a, a, a video i did which <laughs> but uh you can you get the gist with just these images of what i'm trying to show here mm -hmm. you know they're doing the exact same thing that it's no different it's absolutely no different whatsoever and the split mm. ends i believe from new zealand <laughs> another band mm. um yeah stop don't just pick on america bro come on no no it's <laughs> everywhere it's everywhere it's it's a it doesn't matter where you go they all do it you know it's it's not uh, i'm not no, just I'm picking on america absolutely I'm kidding, for sure for it's sure. um it's well unfortunately shocking. the west is you know one of the leaders in in um exporting a lot of this a lot of this stuff as far as you know yeah uh, film television music and uh and the like yeah this is a uh common one that you see i think uh, mind unveiled made a video about my work recently he used this photo and okay. put it ne put it next to the raxious demons i showed you earlier yes and you realize it's identical it's the same yeah. thing you know um mm -hmm. but you look at these old these old posters are absolutely horrifying like <laughs> Yeah, and this was for kids. Are you joking? Like, hang on, I'm going backwards there. Look at these things. Look at this one in the bottom corner here. Could you right. imagine anything more demonic than that? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know I mean? right. Based on what we've what we've you know 
discovered and yeah. and looked at. Um, yeah, there's Dionysus, an early, an early, well, a, a pretty true representation of Dionysus, I would say. Um, he was the wild hairy beast man. He was a wild man, and the people mm. who followed him turned into something similar, satyrs like this. You'll notice his mouth is heart shaped. That's where you get the heart from. That symbol is from Dionysus. It represents really? the it represents the ivy leaf, which was his plant, his flower. That okay. was his patron. And you find a lot of representations of maenads or fauns or of Dionysus incorporate the heart. That's where we get okay. that from. So when we use and Dionysus, Valentine's, was the god of. Uh, said revelry partying wine theater sex partying everything all, mm. all that stuff yeah okay um excess the god of excess which okay. is what all these um wild man traditions do they have a big night partying and drinking and then they then they fast mm. do you get what i mean that's the point so they they channel the spirit of dionysus the wild man and then for one night and then they fast afterwards and that makes everything okay Mm, <laughs> like right. never mind they Perfect. just put never mind they just partook in an ancestor spirit culture veneration ritual where they channeled demons mm. there's nothing christian about that you know there's, there's no way but we think it's a bit of fun we don't take it seriously because we don't understand that yes. that's what it's really all about and you have to wonder what how you know the catholic church you christianize these pagan rituals you know in order to bring people into the fold you have to mm. wonder if they knew what they were doing you know, yeah, you know, I think at some level, I'd say some did, but I don't yeah. know that all. You couldn't know. We can't know, but right. we have to wonder, you know. It, you can't Christianize Satanism, mm. is what mm. I'm trying to say here. You can't do it, you know. And that's what they attempted to do, and that's what you get. You get, it's okay because you fasted that you channeled those demons. You know what I mean? That's basically yeah. what, and it's it just seems so for me. You know, someone who wasn't raised in any particular church or dogma, it just sounds absolutely stupid. Okay, like, right. I don't, I don't get it. It's and I, I think it's foolish that people have fallen for it. To be honest, I really do. I think it's it's something else. But uh, hmm. the seer with the black and white pans as well. It's it's there's another Papua New Guinea tribe. The red uh, nose. Yeah, it's all it's all there. So I think I've given a good showcase for you there. You know of of, of Yes, um, picture, pictorial examples. I think I'll give you a good overview as much as I can on on this theory. Um, do you yes. have any more questions for me now? You know, and I'll, I'll just I'll stop sharing the screen. And I mean, well, you know, we're pushing the two hour mark. I don't want to hold you up too much longer. I think you've definitely challenged and, um, you know, me on a couple things, Christianizing things. It's definitely something I go back and forth with. Um, it's certain things i understand there's certain things that are obvious clear cut you you can't um but um i really don't have any further questions i think you did a great job covering you know presenting the theory um the research i'll say that you know one of the most um powerful examples was definitely uh the the dibden the dibden guys and uh grimaldi uh, the Dibden's trip to India and then coming back and changing the image of the clown from what it was to this obvious, more clear, identifiable representation of Nephilim, of the gods over there. So I definitely encourage you guys uh, to go back, watch the video. Um, I didn't get a whole lot into the Royal Order of Jesters, that kind of thing. Um, um but maybe we could save that for another time we could touch on it as we're pushing two hours yeah um, well the royal order of the jesters just to quickly summarize are okay. a level a level above freemasonry so oh. freemasons once they go through all the ranks all 33 degrees they can become shriners okay the shriners is a step up above from freemasonry shriners are the cults that have the clown groups within them okay but mm -hmm. if you become a full leveled shriner, I think there's 13 levels to shrining, um, you could, by invite only, become a member of the Royal Order of the Jesters. Mm. And you have to be invited. If you ask, you'll never be a member. That's how it works. Okay. And it, it, it's interesting in terms of hierarchy of these secret societies that the higher up you get, the more clown related the symbology becomes. Mm. Because, and the highest level you could be is to be a jester so that mm. tells you how important it is to these secret societies to be a clown 
you know, Oof. it's actually, it, it means a lot to them. It's a symbol to them that we're supposed to think is nothing. Mm. Just, just right. a bit of fun, silly, you know, right. but to them, it's very serious. And the things they got up to, the things they do, I can't talk about it without getting banned or the algorithm taking it down, but sure. it, they are, they are the worst. Right. They are the worst people. Okay. Mm. And they, and if you want to look into it, you can, yes. if you start digging, yeah, F find out the type of things this group get in. Yeah, I'd like the channel to survive past the first interview, so maybe <laughs> yeah, we'll yeah. reserve that. Come up with a way to to share some of that you information. Can, <laughs> you have to mention them simply because they fit in perfectly with the narrative I've just explained to you there. Sure. Yeah, and I have wrote about them in the book, so if you want to get a bit more of a deeper dive, and everything I've said in the book is public knowledge, mm -hmm. and what's public, and what you can get access to, is terrifying. Okay, yeah, it, it is. You yeah. Know? And but I think, I, you know, the largely we're so busy, our lives are, or at least kept so busy that we just don't simply look into these things, right? We have the yeah. kids are at school, they're doing this, they're doing that. We need to work two, three jobs just to pay the bills. We need to, you know, as long as there's food in the refrigerator and as long as, you know, there's a roof over the head, it's to look into these things deeply. The average person is just simply not going to do it. But I just encourage everyone to, you know, take the time to do so um, because, to understand conspiracy, um, it takes a little bit of time for these things to be revealed. You say I did that. I combined the the two shows there. So, but no, man, this is this, this has been this has been awesome. It's been really good, and uh, I'd love to do it again sometime. And um, you know, go ahead and uh, share. I guess how people can find your work and anything that you've got going on, um, yeah. and we'll. Sure. So I'm on YouTube. Just type in Understanding Conspiracy and you'll, you'll pretty quickly find my stuff. I don't just talk about the clowns. This is kind of my project, you know, um, but I, I am a I talk about every topic imaginable within the conspiracy world. Right now, I'm focusing a little bit more on some of this, this really new topic mm -hmm. coming around about um, the millennial reign perhaps already happening. And mm. you know, I'm discussing that concept right now as well. But yeah, if you want to go to my channel, Understanding Conspiracy, you'll find all my work. I have playlists dedicated specifically to the clown stuff. So you can go and see them. You can go watch um, a huge backlog of collaborations with other podcasters where I've talked about this many two hours, many a time, like I have done with you today as well. Mm. Um, you'll probably get a lot more of the same information that you've just seen here, though, in those podcasts, because I do kind of tend to repeat myself. But uh, uh, yeah, there's loads of stuff there. I have a 43-episode series out, uh, maybe 42. I can't remember now. I'm, I'm losing track. But I, I do have more in the line. And I am writing the book on this. Um, like I said, it will be published very soon. Okay. Part, volume, volume one will at least there's so much that i've already written like 330 pages i've got i've got a book and i've just got to the end of the freemason stuff <laughs> you know wow. all that other stuff i showed you with the ancestor spirit cultures uh, that's the second half that will be out in a year's time but wow. if you want to support that you can go to the gofundme all the links yes. are in any description of any video you go on to mine you'll find the links to all these things um you can go pre-order your own copy there if you want or you could wait for mm -hmm. it to be published soon anyway if you want to as well um mm -hmm. so that's for the book that's my youtube channel and i am on rumble now awesome. and i am going nice. through the long process of manually transferring all my videos from youtube to rumble and um, because if you do it automated i've heard rumors that youtube then knows you've gone over to rumble and will shadow ban your channel as punishment so yeah. To work around that, you do it manually. But I have like 400 videos that I'm just I'm doing wow. a, bit, a little bit at a time. Yeah, I so wish I would have jumped on YouTube earlier. Um, I did have a channel, but now it's tough to start something. Or you have to have a certain amount of followers. You have to, I don't know, there's a lot of more hoops to jump through. It's a yeah. bit of a circus, if you will. So yeah, keep a doing little this. bit, and the, and the rules are always changing as well. Pun intended. I mean, I've been on there for a decade, and yeah, the rules are always changing on and, and yeah. you know, I've learned a thing or two as the years go by of what I can right. and cannot talk about, and maybe right. maybe Rumble will be a good place for me to make those yes. videos I can't make on YouTube. Yes, well. I think so, yeah. So, so go, if you're on Rumble, go over there and follow me on there. That'd be great yeah, to I get will. that built up. I've only got like 300 subscribers on there so far okay. but uh right. on youtube i'm on like forty four thousand now so it's taking off you know yeah do, I'm, I'm trying to be clever and just back everything up so check out rumble as well so you yeah, absolutely rumble. i will yeah i will and i'm gonna go ahead and um comment on the three places where this is streaming with your gofundme information um and i'll be sharing your stuff as the weeks go by 
Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and make a, I'm not a rich man yet. So I'm going to make a little contribution to uh, Paul and I encourage you guys to as well, especially if these are things you're interested in or have a passion for or believe that people should um, learn about because I think that the most high is definitely raising up people to, to be, um, you know, prophets and, and people who can deliver truth as the veil um, gets removed more and more as we go on. So yeah, well, I wouldn't call myself a prophet. I'm just a guy who likes to talk, talk a lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I'll the say. prophetic, I guess the one definition of a prophet would be just someone who's has a message, but yes, not that you're. Yeah. And also just to let, just to let you know, uh, Daniel, I will be, I have streamed this to my YouTube, but it's not live. No one's seen it yet. It's unlisted. Good. I plan to release this tomorrow excellent channel so if you want to watch yes. it back tomorrow and um, it might not it might not look as good as yours because i've captured a <laughs> tiny bit of the screen um because of the software i'm using so okay. all, those Im- all those images i shared on my channel they might not actually see everything as well okay. as probably what you've recorded okay. so we'll see but yeah. but it, i will be doing this so hopefully that'll bring you right. some traction as well well thanks for putting up thank you i appreciate that and likewise um and thanks for helping me out for coming aboard with me being a it's kind of an amateur as far as learning the streaming side of things. It's no problem. It's no problem. Uh, so yeah, I really appreciate it, and I'm honored to have such a uh, you know I'd say someone with such a powerful message as you know one of the first to be on. I think that's I think it's awesome, and um, you know helped propel me to want to do this, you know, more and more, the more I learn, the more I, be- I believe the things I've learned aren't just for me. I want to share them. So it comes from that place of, you know, giving God the glory and just wanting people to know. Um, that's actually the first channel I had on rumble was called want you to know. <laughs> so that's kind of my heart. Um, you know, followers and all that and attention. I mean, that's nice, but it's really, I have to remember what inspired me to uh to, to be here and that's just wanting people to know so. absolutely well at, at the end of the day you know i've talked about a lot of scary stuff today a mm-hmm. lot of d- dark things and no it's not it's not fun to look at clowns for a lot of people maybe i'm, I'm a bit desensitized i don't really it doesn't phase me you know but at the end of the day this is a defeated enemy i'm talking about here yes okay they have no authority over you in jesus christ and you remember that power you have over these things and um, they are dead they're done Okay, yes. and then the fate is the lake of fire at the end of all of this, and they know it. All they can do is just cause offenses and 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 as much pain and suffering as they can until that point. That's all they try yeah. to do, and they literally they're literally just trying to have as much pleasure through you if you let them until they're sure. done. Okay, sure. and if if anyone's struggling with any spiritual warfare issues, just fasting helps. Don't get mm-hmm. me wrong; there's physical things you can do. Prayer helps, but just call on the name of Jesus Christ. It's that it's that simple in his authority you have power over these things so no fear no fear is all i'm saying there you go there you go i'm glad that you um ended on that note uh very true and sure if anyone's struggling with those things feel free to message paul or i and we will direct you uh the best we can and Absolutely. with that i think this was a is a great time and um I, i'll hit you up paul later or uh tomorrow with a message and like i said i'll be um send in something to the GoFundMe. I encourage everyone else who can to do so. And in the meantime, stay well, stay blessed. Remember to put on the armor of God uh, each day and just be blessed in Jesus name, everyone. Thanks again, Paul. And I hope to talk to you again soon, bro. Me too. Thank you. All right, brother. You have a great one. This has been revealed. Thank you. No problem. I want you to get together.